Good afternoon everyone, I am Farah Batingalo and I am from group 7, so for today's presentation we will be tackling about the conservation and global change. Conservation, it is a multidisciplinary science that has been developed to address the laws of biological diversity. So, conservation has two central goals, a first to evaluate human impacts on biological diversity and the second one is to develop practical approaches to prevent the extinction of species. So, global change means changes in the global environment that may alter the capacity of Earth to sustain life. So, I will be the first reporter and I will be discussing about the mass extinction. So, without further ado, let's begin. So what is a mass extinction? A mass extinction can be defined as a time period in which a large percentage of all known living species go extinct. There are several causes for mass extinctions, such as climate change, geological catastrophes, for example numerous volcanic eruptions, or even meteor strikes onto Earth's surface. Mass extinction and evolution. How do mass extinction events contribute to evolution? So, after a mass extinction event, there is typically a rapid period of speciation among the few species that do survive. There is a less competition for food resources, shelter, and meat, allowing the leftover species to thrive and reproduce rapidly. Since so many species die off during these catastrophic events, there is more room for the surviving species to spread out. The five major mass extinction events. These five mass extinction include the Ordovician mass extinction, Devonian mass extinction, Permian mass extinction, Triassic Jurassic mass extinction, and Cretaceous tertiary or the KT mass extinction. The first mass extinction is the Ordovician mass extinction. So when did it happen? The Ordovician period of the Paleozoic era, about 440 million years ago. Size of the extinction, up to 85% of all living species eliminated. Suspected cause or causes, continental drift, and subsequent climate change. The first known major mass extinction event occurred during the Ordovician period of the Paleozoic era of the geologic time scale. The cause of this mass extinction event is thought to be the shift in the continent's anthropic climate change. Sea levels lowered and many land species could not adapt fast enough to survive harsh climates. It happened in two waves, one, an ice age, and the other is a sudden end to the ice age. So the second major mass extinction is the Devonian mass extinction. When? The Devonian period of the Paleozoic era, about 275 million years ago, size of the extinction, nearly 80% of all living species eliminated, suspected cause or causes lack of oxygen in the oceans, quick cooling of air, temperatures, volcanic eruptions, and or meteor strikes. There are several hypotheses as to why this second mass extinction occurred at that time in geologic history. So the first wave, the first may have been caused by land colonizing land, leaving fewer autotrophs to create the oxygen for all of the sea level. This lead to mass death in the ocean. The second wave, the Devonian mass extinction, is more of a mystery. It could have included mass volcanic eruptions and some major strikes, but the exact cause is still considered unknown. So the third major mass extinction, the Permian mass extinction. So when did it happen? The Permian period of the Paleozoic era, about 250 million years ago, size of the extinction, an estimated 96% of all living species eliminated, suspected cause or causes unknown, possibly asteroid strikes, volcanic activity, climate change, and microbes. This is the largest of all known mass extinction with a massive 96% of all species on Earth completely lost. It is no wonder, therefore, that this major mass extinction has been dubbed the Great Dying. Aquatic and terrestrial life forms alike perished relatively quickly as the event took place. It is still much of a mystery what set off these great mass extinction events. 
So the fourth major mass extinction, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. When did it happen? The end of the Triassic period of the Mesozoic era about 200 million years ago. Size of the extinction, more than half of all living species eliminated. Suspected coast or causes, major volcanic activity with basalt flooding, global climate change, and changing pH and sea levels of the oceans. So the fifth major mass extinction is the KT mass extinction. So when did it happen? The end of the Cretaceous period of the Mesozoic era about 65 million years ago. Size of the extinction nearly 75% of all living species eliminated. Suspected cause or causes extreme asteroid or meteor impact. The Cretaceous Tertiary Mass Extinction or KT extinction became the dividing line between the final period of the Mesozoic Era, the Cretaceous Period, and the Tertiary Period of the Cenozoic Era. It is also the event that wiped out the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were not the only species to go extinct. However, up to 75% of all known living species died during this mass extinction event. Supposedly, there are only five major mass extinction events, but as I researched more, the sixth major mass extinction happening now. So is it possible? Is it possible that we are in the midst of the sixth major mass extinction? Many scientists believe that we are. A number of known species have been lost since human evolution. Since these mass extinction events can take millions of years, perhaps we are witnessing the sixth major mass extinction event as it happens. Whether or not human will survive has yet to be determined. So that will be the end of my discussion. So the next reporter will be Rakiza Gaugai and she will be discussing about the human activities and its impact on Earth's biodiversity. So Rakiza Gaugai, it's your turn. Hi everyone, I am Rakiza C. Gaugai. I am assigned to discuss about the human activities and its impact on Earth biodiversity. So let's start with the extension. So what is extension? Extension is a natural phenomenon that has been occurring since life first evolved. It is a high rate of extension that is responsible for today's biodiversity crisis. Because we can only estimate the number of a species currently existing, we cannot determine the exact rate of species loss. However, we do know that the extension rate is high and that human activities threaten earth biodiversity at all levels. So what are these three levels of biodiversity? Biodiversity, short for biological diversity, can be considered at three main levels, genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. A genetic diversity comprises not only the individual genetic variation within a population, but also the genetic variation between populations that is often associated with adaptation to local conditions. Will the species diversity public awareness of the biodiversity crisis centers of species diversity, the variety of species in an ecosystem or across the biosphere? It endangered species act defines an endangered species as one that is in danger of extension throughout all or significant portion of its range, while the treated species are those considered likely to become endangered in the near future. The last level of the biodiversity is the ecosystem diversity, which is the variety of the biosphere's ecosystems in a third level of biological diversity. Because of the many interactions between populations of different species in an ecosystem, the local extension of one species can have a negative impact on other species in the ecosystem. So now, I will be discussing the human activities that treat in the biodiversity. Many different human activities treat in biodiversity on local, regional, and global scales. The treats 
poses by these activities are of four major types, which are the habitat loss, anthrogen species, over-harvesting, and global change. So let's begin with the habitat loss. Human alteration of habitat is single greatest threat to biodiversity throughout the biosphere. Habitat loss has been brought about by factors such as agriculture, urban development, forestry, mining, and pollution. As discussed later in this chapter, global climate change is already altering habitats today and will have an ever in larger effect later this century. Remember that when no alternative habitat is available or species is unable to move, habitat loss may mean extension. Habitat loss and fragmentation may occur over immense regions, approximately 98 of the tropical dry forests of Central America and Mexico have been cut down. The clearing of tropical rainforests in the state of Veracruz, Mexico mostly for castle ranching, has resulted in the loss of more than 90% of the original forests, leaving relatively small, isolated patches of forests. Other natural habitats have also been fragmented by human activities. Example of this is the habitat fragmentation in the foothills of Los Angeles. Development in the valley may confine the organism that inhabit the narrow strips of hillside. Habitat loss is also a major threat to aquatic biodiversity. About 70% of our coral reefs among Earth's most species-rich aquatic communities have been damaged by human activities. At the current rate of destruction, 40 to 50 of the reefs, home to one-third of marine fish species, could disappear in the next 30 to 40 years. Freshwater habitats are also being lost often as a result of a dams, reservoirs, channel modification, and flow regulation now affecting most of the world's rivers. Number two is the anthrogen species. Anthrogen species, also called exotic species, are those that humans are intentionally or accidentally from the species' native locations to new geographical regions. Humans' travel by ship and airline has accelerated the transplant of species, free from the predators, parasites, and pathogens that limit their populations in their native habitats. Such transplanted species may spread rapidly through a new region. Some introduced species disrupt their new community, often preying on native organisms or competing native organisms for resources. The brown tree snake was accidentally introduced to the island of Guam from other parts of the South Pacific after World War II as a stowaway and military cargo. Since then, 12 species of birds and 6 species of lizards that the snake eat have become extinct on Guam. Another is the dev devastating gibber mussel, a filter-feeding mollusk, was introduced into the Great Lakes of North America in 1988, mostly likely in the ballast water of ships arriving from Europe. Gibber mussel have formed dense colonies and have disrupted freshwater ecosystems, threatening native aquatic species. Humans have deliberately introduced many species with good intentions but disastrous effects. An Asian plant called Guzu, which the U.S. Department of Agriculture once introduced in the southern United States to help control erosion, has taken over large areas of the landscape there. Number three is the over-harvesting. The term over-harvesting refers generally to the harvesting of a wild organism at traits exceeding the ability of their populations to rebound. Species with extracted habitats such as small islands are particularly vulnerable to over-harvesting. One such species was the great oak, a large flat like leaf seabird found in Ireland in the North Atlantic Ocean. By the 1840s, humans had hunted the great auk to extension to satisfy demand for its feeder, eggs, and meat. Also susceptible to over-harvesting are large organisms with low reproductive rates such as elephants, whales, and rhinoceroses. 
An example of this is an ecological forest six, an alipant poaching. These several tusks were part of an illegal shipment of ivory intercepted on its way from Africa to Singapore in 2002. DNA-based evidence shows that the thousands of elephants killed for the tox came from the relatively narrow as well as bond-centered and Zambia, Zambia rather than form from across Africa. Another is the over-harvesting in North Atlantic bluefin tuna are auctioned in Japanese fish market. And lastly, the global change. The fourth tree to biodiversity global change alters the fabric on Earth's ecosystems at regional to global scales. Global change includes alterations in climate, atmospheric chemistry, and brood ecological system that reduce the capacity of Earth to sustain life. One of the first types of global change to cause concern was acid precipitation, which is rain, snow, slate, or fog with pH less than 5.2. The burning of wood and fossil fuels releases oxides of sulfur and nitrogen that react with water in air, forming sulfuric and nitric acids. The acids eventually fall to earth surface, harming some aquatic and terrestrial organisms. In the 1960s, ecologists determined that lake-dwelling organisms in eastern Canada were dying because of air pollution from factories in the Midwestern United States. Newly hacked lake trout, for instance, die when the pH drops below 5.4. Lakes and streams in southern Norway and Sweden were losing fish because of pollution generated in Great Britain and Central Europe. By 1980, the pH of precipitation in large areas of North America and Europe averaged 4.0 to 4.5 and sometimes dropped as low as 3.0. And once again, I am Marquisa C. Gaugai and the next topic will be discussed by my groupmates. I am Siti Farhan El Mahotara. I will be discussing about population conservation. Population conservation is knowledge of species abundance and distribution is an essential part of conservation biology. Establish conservation plans for a threatened and endangered species. Establish management plans for harvested populations. Now, the results can be fed into regional, national, and global databases for analysis to determine the effectiveness of the conservation and man management solutions and to provide an early warning of problems. For example, we examine this graph that illustrates the population data for those house power in England from 1976 to 2003. We can see that the population is in decline by analyzing this data and relating it to other data. Like for example, the introduction of the house cat, we might be able to establish the reasonings behind the decline of this population and come up with a reasonable plan for its recovery. Now, as we collect measurements of population, there are two different measurements that we might obtain either an absolute density or a relative density. Absolute density. Absolute density is the number of individual per area per volume important for conservation and management. Relative density. Relative density is a comparison of the number of individuals between two different areas. Provide only an index of abundance. Absolute density. Total counts. A total count is achieved through the dry counting of all the individuals in a population. Much like we do with the U.S. population, census, we could go into a forest and count the number of the trees. Or if we have a breeding colony of organisms like these harbor cells, we can take a picture and then count the population later. In general though, total counts are only possible for very few animals because typically animals are always moving around and it'd be very easy for you to double count the same individual. Another way to determine absolute density is through sampling, with sampling used the count of, the, of a small proportion of the population to estimate the total population. For example, instead of counting all of these ants, we only count a few of those and use that as a proportionate. 
Example of the total population and ex extrapolate out to the figure out the total population. Now, in general, there are two types of sampling techniques using quadrats and the capture method. Using quadrats, counts all the individuals in several small, typical re rectangular plots, then extrapolate the average count to the whole area. Useful for plants and slow moving animals. Requirements for quadrant sampling. Number one is the population in the quadrant must be determined exactly. Number two is area of the quadrant must be known. Number three, quadrants must be representative of the area and achieve by random sampling. Capture recapture. A portion of the population is captured, marked, and released. Later, another portion is captured and the number of marked individuals within the sample is counted. Since the number mark of individuals within the second sample should be proportional to the number of marked individuals in the whole population, an estimate of the total population size can be obtained by dividing the number of marked individuals by the proportion of marked individuals in the second sample. Now, to determine relative density, there is a couple of different strategies. We can observe the number of artifacts that were left behind by that organism and in some cases, the pupil cases of emerging insects, fecal pellets. We can put questionnaires out to sportsmen or trappers so that we can get an idea of how many fish or how many forbearing animals that they're capturing because of their having successful seasons that typically might tell us that relatively speaking there's good populations of those individual organism. We might put pit out and see how quickly that pit gets eaten. It's it is slowly eating then maybe there's few organisms that are attracted to that bit. It really quickly maybe there's a lot of individuals. We might look at our ground cover. For example, with forest we can estimate the average size and then how many trees that we can kind of see and kind of extrapolate out the percent ground. Cover to the population of say for instance trees we might do some round side counts so that we as we drive along, count the number of birds across a certain distance and then extrapolate that out to figure out the re relative density. Good afternoon everyone, I am May Antes and I will be the one who will going to discuss about the landscape and regional conservation. So without further ado, let's begin. What is landscape-based conservation? Landscape scale conservation is a holistic approach to landscape management that aims to balance the competing goals of environmental protection and economic activity across a landscape. Because of climate change, landscape scale conservation may be tried on occasion. The science of ecology is divided into three categories, the theoretical ecology, empirical ecology, and applied ecology. Theoretical ecology. Theoretical ecology is concerned with the mathematical world, which is all too often just tangentially concerned with environmental issues. It has its own journals and a whole slew of sophisticated debates with little real-world applications. It's best for speculation speculating on what might happen if certain mathematical assumptions are made. It is without a doubt that the most respected branch of ecology, partially due to the exquisite mathematics involved and partly due to the fact that it avoids all of the complications of real-world ecological systems. It's all about ecology's physics. As a result, it exists in its own realm and is mostly overlooked by people working in the other two primary areas of ecology. Next is the empirical ecology. The goal of empirical ecology 
is to learn how the natural world operates at the level of individuals, populations, communities, and ecosystems. Its practitioners, in their pur purest form, are unconcerned about fixing real ecological or environmental problems, but they do so on the assumption that the information they provide will be beneficial now or in the future. It looks for generalization but seldom finds it since everyone and every species play the ecological game of existence differently. The devil is in the de details. It says if it has a mantra, the difficulty is that the nitty gritty of empirical ecology is said just to politicians, business people, and much of the current television generation, which has a 7 second or 140 character attention span. Applied ecology. Applied ecology is where the action is right now, and you should be an applied ecologist, whether you're a conservation biologist, a forester, or an ag agricultural scientist. If you want to stay current, applied ecologists live by the philosophy of doing no harm to the environment while solving real-world problems. Applied ecologists are required to incorporate the human stump into empirical ecology. Therefore, diminishing populations and extinctions of plants and animals are of great concern to them. Humans have a major, although not exclusive, impact on the climate change, and much of applied ecology can be traced back to the effects of climate change on ecosystems, all of which is exacerbated by the growing human population and its rising demands. However, applied ecologists are constantly at the forefront of today's environmental difficulties since problems increase faster than feasible remedies can be assessed. This should result in more employment for applied ecologies, but the reverse appears to the case, since governments frequently neglect long-term issues beyond their four-year mandate. Consider climate change if you disagree. What is the relationship between landscape ecology and conservation biology? Its goal is to investigate patterns, processes, and changes in a hectare to square kilometer scale. So it emphasizes on the structure and dynamics of ecosystems or patches within a landscape has a lot of conservation biology implications. Environmental change that human causes. We have become reliant on luxuries such as cars, houses, and even cell phones. But what impact does our adoration for manufactured metallic and plastic goods have on environment? Overconsumption, overfishing, and deforestation are all having a significant impact on our world. Air pollution consists of chemicals or particles in the air that can harm the health of humans, animals, and plants. It also damages buildings. People do not have access to safe drinking water. Humanity is constantly polluting essential resources such as air, water, and soil, which take millions of years to replenish. A wildfire is an uncontrolled fire that burns in the wildland vegetation. Often in rural areas, wildfires can burn in forests, grassland, savannas, and other ecosystems and have been doing so for hundreds of millions of years. They are not limited to a particular continent or environment. Climate change, the Earth's weather patterns will change dramatically as global temperatures rise. Poor air quality and rising temperatures are destroying delicate ecosystems and even increasing asthma and cancer rates in humans, according to mounting evidence. Overpopulation, as the population grows, so does the demand for food, water, housing, energy, healthcare, transportation, and other necessities 
All of this consumption contributes to environmental degradation, increased conflicts, and an increased risk of large-scale disasters such as pandemics. Deforestation is a major threat to the survival of millions of different species that lives in forest, making it a major conservation issue. The loss of animals and plant species due to the habitat loss is one of the most dangerous and unsettling effects of deforestation. Forests are home to 70% of all land animals and plant species. Deforestation endangers not only known species but also unknown species. Soil erosion is also caused by overgrazing, which causes floods too. Overgrazing is caused by intensive cattle raising, as plants don't have the recovery period they need. They end up being crushed and compacted by cattle. Water pollution, the contamination of water bodies, usually as a result of human activity in such a way that it interferes with their legitimate uses. Water pollution not only in garbage dump into the oceans, but so is excessive fertilizer, which finds its way into the ocean via rain, floods, and winds, or is dumped in excess right into the largest producer of oxygen we have. Overfishing pollution is the number one threat to all aquatic life and the primary cause of biodiversity loss. Overfishing is Particularly unfortunate given that water and aquatic life forms are among the most important natural resources at our disposal. However, as previously stated, overfishing is also harming our oceans. Ozone depletion, the ozone layer is well known for its ability to absorb harmful UV rays that would otherwise be harmful to people's health. Human impact is devastating for plants that are extremely sensitive to UV light, such as wheat and barley, which are both essential crops for humans. Humans have a wide range of effects on the natural environment, and we must be conscious of our personal environmental impact. Whether or not we can live with it is entirely dependent on the decisions and actions we take next. Mother Nature is an unyielding, unforgiving force, so we should probably treat her well and maybe, just maybe, we can make up for the damage that has already been done. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Rainsy Pobas, so I will talk about the Sustainable Development Goals. But before that, let's have the 5 P's, which are the People, Prosperity, Peace, Partnership, and Planet. Also, the three core elements of SDG or the Sustainable Development Goals, the economic growth, social inclusion, and the last one is the environmental protection. Let's proceed to our main topic, which is the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So the first one is the no poverty. Eradicating poverty in all its forms remains one of the greatest challenges facing humanity. So this one involves targeting the most vulnerable, increasing basic resources and services, and supporting communities affected by conflict and climate-related disasters. So next one is the zero hunger. The number of undernourished people has dropped by almost half in the past two decades of rapid economic growth and increased agricultural productivity. So this one involves promoting a sustainable agricultural, supporting small-scale farmers and equal access, technology and markets also requires international cooperation to ensure investment in infrastructure and technology to improve agricultural productivity. So the third one is the good health and well-being. Good health is essential to sustainable development. It takes to account widening economic and social inequalities, rapid urbanization threats to the climate and the environment, the continuing burden of HIV and other infectious diseases. 
So, this one, emerging of global health priorities, not explicitly included in the SDGs, including antimicrobial resistance and also demand action. So the fourth one is the quality education. The total enrollment rate in developing regions reached 91% in 2015, and the worldwide number of children out of school has dropped by almost half. So achieving inclusive and quality education for all reaffirms the belief that education is one of the most powerful and proven uh, vehicles for sustainable development also aims to provide equal access to affordable uh, vocational training to eliminate uh, gender and wealth uh, disparities and achieve universal access uh, to uh, quality higher education so the fifth one is the gender equality ending all discrimination against women and girls is not only a basic human right it's crucial for a sustainable future it's proven that empowering women and girls helps economic growth development it is vital to give women equal rights land and property sexual and reproductive health and also the technology and the internet so the next one is the clean water and sanitation. More and more countries are experiencing water stress and increasing growth. And desertification is already worsening these trends. So ensuring universal, safe, and affordable drinking water involves reaching over 800 million people who lack basic services and improving accessibility and safety of services for over 2 billion. But the next one is the affordable and clean energy. As the population continues to grow, the demand cheap energy and an economy reliant on fossil fuels is creating drastic changes to our climate. So, expanding infrastructure and upgrading technology to provide clean and more efficient energy in all countries will encourage growth and help the environment. The next is the decent work and economic growth. Over the past 25 years, the number of workers living in extreme poverty has declined dramatically despite the active impact of the 2008 economic crisis and global recession so the sdgs promote sustained economic growth higher levels of productivity and technological innovation next one is the industry innovation and infrastructure investments in infrastructure and innovation are crucial drivers of economic growth and development so technological progress is also key to finding lasting solutions to both economic and environmental challenges such as providing new jobs and promoting energy efficiency so the next one is reduce inequalities income inequality has increased in nearly everywhere in recent decades but at different speeds this widening disparities requires sound policies to empower lower income earners and promote economic inclusion of all regardless of sex, race, or ethnicity. Let's proceed to the next, which is the sustainable cities and communities. Making cities sustainable means creating career and business opportunities safe and affordable housing and building resilient societies and economies sustainable development cannot be achieved without significantly transforming the way we build and manage our urban spaces so next is responsible consumption and production the efficient management of our shared natural resources and the way we dispose of toxic waste and pollutants are important targets to achieve this goal. Achieving economic growth and sustainable development requires that we urgently 
uh, reduce our ecological footprint by changing the way we produce and consume goods and resources. Let's proceed to the next, which is the climate action. Uh, supporting vulnerable regions will directly contribute not only to Goal 13, but also for other SDG. These actions must also go hand in hand with efforts to integrate disaster risk measures, sustainable natural resource management, and human security into national development strategies. So global warming is causing a long-lasting changes to our climate system, which threatens irreversible consequence if we do not act. So next is the life below water, the world's oceans, the temperature, chemistry, currents, and life drive global systems that make the earth habitable for humankind. The SDGs aim to sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystems from pollution as well as address the impacts of ocean acidification and also the life on land human life depends on the earth as much as the ocean for our sustenance and livelihoods urgent action must be taken to reduce the loss of natural habitats and biodiversity which are part of our common heritage and support global food and water security, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, and peace and security. The second to the last of the SDG goals is the peace, justice, and strong institutions. Armed violence and insecurity have a destructive impact on countries' development, affecting economic growth and often resulting in grievances that last for generations. SDGs aim to uh, significantly reduce all forms of violence and work with governments and communities to end conflict and security. Here's the last one, which is the partnerships for the goals. The world is more interconnected than ever improving access to technology and knowledge is an important way to share ideas and foster innovation. The goals aim to enhance the north to south and south to south cooperation by supporting national plans to achieve all the targets that's it for today guys i hope you learn a lot of this topic about the sustainable development goals technological innovation for sustainability so what is a technological innovation for sustainability it requires harnessing technological innovation to improve human well-being in current and future generations. Sustainability is a broad term that describes managing resources without depleting them for the future generations. This concept goes beyond environmental sustainability, which concerns Earth's natural resources, to include economic and social sustainability, which is related to meet people's current economic and social needs without compromising future generations. So, there have a six principles for sustainability. First is circular economy. It aims to improve resource efficiency through better waste management. Second is energy saving. Innovative and lead all play a part in providing better lightning. Third is sustainable material choice. Fourth is environmental production declaration. This allows insight and detailed information on the life cycle, performance of product, and the environmental impact of the material. Fifth is constant research and innovation. And the sixth is corporate social responsibility. Nine technological innovations will shape the sustainability. We're talking a fresh look at where sustainability is headed globally. First is public electric transport. Only individual vehicle owners who have better access to electric vehicles than ever before. 
there are 160 electric and hybrid vehicle models available today, but municipalities are taking notice as well. Second is electric trucks. Electric vehicles grabbing more and more marketing share. Commercial fleets could follow so rapidly, but to ensure an efficient transition. Third is cheap energy storage. This is a new age of electric vehicles has rapidly expanded the market for lithium and cobalt batteries. Fourth is long-term storage. So the long-term storage is the lithium batteries are great for addressing short-term storage needs a uh, 4 to 5 hours. Fifth is plastic recycling. The plastic industry has the opportunity to move away from a take, make, and dispose. Business model and adapt a circular model. One promising circular process is prolysis, which uses heat and the absence of oxygen to reconvert plastic waste back into liquid feedstock. Six is lead light efficiency. Lead lighting is quickly replacing traditional incandescent bulbs in American homes. Lead lights will reduce energy consumption by 40%. 7 is accessible solar power. This is a trend that has major implications for the nearly 1 billion people across the globe without access to electricity. 8 is carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage is allows industry to capture carbon and its source, compress it, and move it into a suitable permanent storage site. The technology not only has the potential to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it can also mean more money if the carbon dioxide can be used profitably to make other products. And the last is hydrogen in the energy transition. It is difficult to imagine how we meet ambitious global warming benchmarks without including hydrogen as a critical part of the solution. Hydrogen lead pathways to cleaning up the environment for climate. So in conclusion, biodiversity is an issue that affects everyone and therefore everyone should be aware of their effect on biodiversity. As biodiversity decreases on Earth, so do the chances of human survival. Therefore, it is important to educate people on living in equilibrium with the environment. It is also important to make sure that the government is making laws that will ensure biodiversity for the future and not focus on short-sighted economics. If humans become extinct, it will likely be a result of their own action or lack of action. Hopefully, humans will realize this before it is too late. So that's the end of our discussion. I hope you guys learned something from us. Good luck for our final exam. Thank you and may God bless us all.